have been looking is why is it so difficult for Mexico to really look at the possibility of integration and open its economy? We are looking at the background information on how Mexico developed its economy for many, many years, as a result of which most of the combination of interest groups that we have in the country, politicians' frame of mind of what should be the way that we can get development, and many people in the country really were against the possibility of integration. But the key question is why all of a sudden Mexico has become the champion of opening the economy? Why is it that we moved into this mood of opening the economy? And so the key question for all of us is the why? Why, why is Mexico transforming itself from a closed economy to an open economy? How do we determine that we are an open economy today? How do we determine that we are an open economy? If someone comes to you and says, the Mexican economy is an open economy, or the Brazilian economy is a closed economy, how would you define the fact that we are an open and they are a closed economy? We have a lot of tweets that mm -hmm. promotes no, trade. The, the trade agreements are going to be a consequence of the definition. And as a result of that, yes, we're going to become an open economy. But we may have trade agreements and still be considered a closed economy. How would you make up a decision? How would you make a comparison between a country like, let's say, Brazil, <coughs> and a country like Mexico, and say, which one is more open? Let's assume for the sake of assumption that we have 42 countries, both or with whom we have a treaty of you know, some kind of free trade agreement. So let's assume that we are having the same thing, and then you say, how do I know whether Brazil is more open or more closed than Mexico, or vice versa? Because of the protectionism Brazil government. That's going to give me an idea, but what, what would be the, really the key element that would tell me whether you are more open or more close? Uh, no, because let's suppose I am Volkswagen of Mexico, and I am taking a decision as a multinational company to come to Mexico and make an investment. And the Mexican government says to me, if you come to Mexico, I will close my market. And that will be your market, which is exactly how we develop the automotive industry in Mexico. If I do that, then in fact I have foreign direct investment, but I'm not an open economy. The, the, the kind of integration that you have, like you can allow uh, this level of integration the tariffs that you Okay, that would give me an idea, but if my tariffs are less or lower than other countries, then I am not really taking the assumption that I am working in WTO. And as I work in WTO, I'm going to have the same type of tariffs all over the world. So how, how do you decide whether a person is overweight or not? <laughs> a little bit after vacations. <laughs> but how do you know that? Because of the how he works, you compare yourself? Oh. Look, look at the way he makes, and I didn't say anything, he said it, okay? What he said is, a little bit after vacation. What is your standard of comparison be between before vacation and after vacation? The closest I wear. Okay, the clothes you wear, but basically in your weight. Yeah? Yes. You're going, yeah, you're going to get into this thing. I just stood up and said, oh my God, I'm two kilos heavier than I was last week. Yeah? So it's going to be your weight. What would be then the, the, the comparison? What would be the number that we use in our economy? Well, it has to be imports and exports in comparison to what? To your GDP. Yeah? So what you're going to say is, let me see what is the level of imports and the level of exports of this country in proportion to GDP. Okay. If I have imports as a proportion of GDP equal to 30%, okay, this is the ratio of imports 
for GDP in the country, and if I have exports as a proportion of GDP, also 30%, then I know that foreign trade represents 60% of GDP. Okay, foreign trade as a proportion of GDP. Okay? I look at this number and I said, in Mexico, imports and exports represent 60% of GDP. I look at the same number in Brazil, and I found 40% of imports and exports represent the proportion. This country, therefore, is a more open economy than this country. Okay? Basically, what this country is doing, it has a larger proportion of all its GDP related to foreign trade, whereas this country has a smaller proportion. So I know that this country is more open than this country in terms of the results of the balance of payments. Okay? If you look at these kind of combinations, you will say, well, then what about the United States? How open is the United States compared to? And these are the kind of questions that you will be asking. As you saw in what we were looking before, the proportion of imports to exports in Mexico was very low. Okay? What we saw is this economy, when I was looking at the proportion of exports and imports as a proportion of GDP, it was only 17% in the year 1956. So this is a very close economy in terms of the proportion of total trade with respect to GDP. Okay? And if I keep looking at these numbers, I see an economy which in fact, during the whole period, of growth through substitution of imports was a very close economy. Okay? And that's exactly what we were. So our mentality was a mentality of a close economy. This is what you can see. What you will see today is a complete change. What you will see today is these numbers all of a sudden went to 30 and 30 or more. Okay? So the switch of Mexico is going to be a very interesting switch. But the big question for all of us is, what made a country like this become a country like this? What made a country that was a closed economy become a country with an open economy? We began to see that last time. And what we saw was, that as we ended up in a situation where my balance of payments had trouble and my fiscal deficit had trouble, all of a sudden I transformed myself from a country that really had no exports into a country which has a large amount of exports. More importantly, a country that was basically a mono-exported country, one item taking this large proportion, to a country that slowly diminishes the importance of oil and increases the importance of manufacturers in its economy. So what you're, what you're looking here right now is really the transformation of that country. What you're looking about is a country that was a closed economy, very small proportion of exports and imports, more dependence on one single good, oil, as the largest factor of the exports of this country. Look at the proportion right here, okay? We had 21 billion US dollars as exports, out of which 16 were oil. We are a heavily dependent economy, not only in terms of our fiscal side, but in terms of our balance of payments side on one good, and that good is coal, oil. And the question here for us is, if we are so dependent on one single thing, then the danger is that we end up in a situation like this. Okay. When will that happen? If the price of oil turns against us and goes down, then I'm going to be in trouble. Because if I depend on one single good, as the earner of the largest amount of foreign exchange that I have in my economy, 
If the price of that good goes down, then I'm going to be in trouble. I may be producing the same amount in volume terms, but not in income terms, because the price times volume gives me my income, and if the price goes down, I'm going to be in trouble. So one of the things I am looking for is diversification of exports. Okay. And as I diversify in exports, I end up in this situation. Yeah, but he was talking about a different thing, okay? He was talking about the fiscal balance. Okay, what I'm talking about right here is the foreign, if you want to put it that way, balance, okay? Which is, this implies I'm earning dollars, or if you want to put any name, it's foreign exchange. The problem of Mexico is that at this point in time, we have a combination of both. My balance of payments and my fiscal balance depend on oil. Yeah? What we have done in the past 20 years is we have reduced the balance of payments situation in terms of its fragility regarding oil. Is that clear to all? You have to be very careful there, okay? What Mexico has been able to do is it has been able to reduce basically to zero the dependence of the balance of payments equilibrium in oil. What Mexico has not been able to do is to reduce its dependence on the fiscal balance on oil. So what we have today is a fiscal problem if the price of oil goes down. But we don't have a balance of payments problem. But why is that important? I'm going to ask Jose right there in the back. But I'm answering your question first. I, I want to know, like, um, I, I don't understand. If we have to diversificate um, the, the products and we also have to specialize in something, then how do we get that equilibrium between those two theories? Like, if you specialize, then you might suffer, um, then you have to diversify. All the examples that we use in class are simplified examples, yeah? So we always tell you that you have to specify the thing that you are more competent on. In, in an economy, that's going to be a lot of things. It's not going to be one single thing. Okay? When you make the mistake of going into one single thing, if you specialize only in oil, then you're going to be subject to the vagaries of the price of oil. If the price of oil goes down, you're in trouble. Okay? So normally, you don't want that to happen in your economy. What you will do is you will say, well, look, the price of oil is something that is subject to the market. I cannot control that. And therefore, I have to be very concerned about what I am doing as a country. If I specialize in oil, then I have to understand what I want to use the oil for. What oil? The oil revenues. Yeah? Normally, what you will do then is you will take the oil and you will say, I am blessed because I have lots of oil. Why is oil important in today's world? What else? It's the energy. Is the energy of? Cars. Okay. You see, th this is what's very important for <laughs> us to understand. Um, what kind of economic processes do we have? in our economies. So let's look at the world in year 1800. 
What happens between 1,800 and 1,900? What happened in the world? Okay, we had the Industrial Revolution, yeah? So, if you, it, it's, you need to read history, okay? If, if, if one looks at the history of the world, and one looks at how per capita income was in a very long period of time, you're going to find something fascinating. What you're going to find is that we were starving basically for years and years and years and years and years and years. Okay, you can go all the way to the time of Jesus Christ, okay? And look how growth was so bad that your per capita income basically is a flat line. Okay? And then all of a sudden, something happens in the history of humanity. And all of a sudden, we have this jump. And per capita income starts going like that. GDP starts going like that. And then you ask yourself, what happened in this particular time? What kind of people did we have that transformed this flat line into this incredible growing line? See, the problem with most of us is we were born in the time that everything was good, okay? And so we cannot imagine the world at the Middle Ages. It's, it's very interesting. One of the things that we all do is we tend to project our society as it is today and analyze things that happened in the past as if they were things that are happening today. And, and it's very difficult to do that. I mean, it's very easy for us because we understand that we have to really translate what we are today to how a person thought in the year 1320. And here we are, you know? Creatures of the 21st century, moving ourselves into the 1300s and thinking this is the way they should have behaved. Well, they behaved the way they behaved because that was the 1300s, okay? And people were starving to death almost systematically. Now, we have a lot of poverty in the 21st century, yes. We have a lot of problems in the 21st century, that's true. But make no mistake, you are very lucky to have been born in the 20th and 21st century. Because if you had been born in the 14th century, your lives would be completely different, particularly the women's lives, okay? So, when we look at this situation, you have to think about two things, okay? The first one is, trade theory tells me, trade theory tells me, that I have to specialize. Because that will increase welfare for everybody. Yeah? This is what we saw at the beginning of the course. And that's why it's so important that we accept it or understand it, okay? Because what it means really is, if you try to do everything by yourself, you're going to be worse off than if you specialize and start getting Things in which you are better than others, you do. Things that others are better than you, they do. And then the output will be higher, things will be better, we will be happier. Then we switch and say, well, yeah, it's not only that. Someone could be better than you in everything, and still there is advantages. Comparative advantage. In terms of, you specialize in something, I specialize in something. Because then we will be better off. Comparative advantage. If I accept those principles, what I'm saying is trade makes sense, let's go into trade. Trade and markets make sense. Let's trade, let's go into markets, and let's define benefits. Sometimes you're going to have more benefits than I do, and that is okay because I am going to be better off, even though you are going to be better, better off than I am going to be. Okay? If I start saying, no, I want the same exchange, then there is going to be no trade. I am going to be worse off and you are going to be worse off. Theory tells me you are going to be better off if you do trade, if you specialize. Now, there is another thing that I have to look at. I am a country, I am not a person. And so I am looking at the overall development of the country. And I am thinking, if I am going to be doing that, 
I'm going to be specializing in those things in which I'm better than the others. Okay? Then I find oil. And the reason why oil is so important, coming back to my question, is because in the 1800s, 40s, 50s of the 1800s, 60s, something that we call the Industrial Revolution started. But it started on the basis of exploiting a source of energy, which was very important. And we started with coal. And we started inventing machines that by using coal, transform the energy into output and allow the whole society to be more productive. Your productivity increased. But the whole technology that we started and developed during those years was based on energy transformation that utilized hydrocarbons as the basis for energy transformation. And so we went from coal into oil and gas. Still hydrocarbons, better in terms of the efficiency and the results that we got. But if you think about what you said to me a little while ago, everything that you are thinking of is based on energy, and that energy is hydrocarbons. A car. How does the car work? It needs gasoline. How do you get the gasoline? Where do you get it from? Oil. And therefore, oil is very important. How do you get production of any kind of energy? You're going to use gas or oil. So gas and oil are very important. And the whole productive system that we are basing our welfare on is based on energy consumption. And that energy consumption is based on hydrocarbons. Okay. Why is it so difficult then to make the world understand that we are contaminated and polluting the world and therefore blah, 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 blah? Because our welfare depends on energy consumption and that energy is all based on, all our production system structure is based on oil, carbon, gas. Let's use eolic energy. Yeah, but it's very expensive, it's difficult to get, so on and so forth. And so, whatever you do, you look at something which is called abundance, and then you find that oil, gas, carbon are abundant, whereas the other ones are not. Oh, but I am convinced that the world is polluting itself, and we are going to die in this polluting. Yeah, well, you know what? It's either that or starving. Which one you take? Starving takes you about 30 days to die. The other one takes you about 30 days, 30 years to die. Which one do you prefer? I'm exaggerating, but what I'm telling you right now is the problem that we're facing as a world is because we have so many people in poverty, it's very difficult to convince many governments that it makes sense to do all these energy saving processes. Because what they are saying is, look, it's more important for me to develop myself, get all these things, and I will talk about pollution later, because right now what I'm talking about is starvation. And so I'm concerned about starvation, I'm going to be doing these things. If I look at this, and I'm going to, answer, uh, I'm going to tell you a question, but if I, if I look at this, what the Mexican government does is, all of a sudden I have oil, at a time when there is a lot of demand for oil. The price of oil is very high, and therefore, all of a sudden, all the constraints I had found when I came to power in 1970, 76, and I had to substitute my program of import substitution for a different type of development strategy are solved because I am rich. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using oil to transform my economy. So I'm going to be taking advantage of the fact that I have something that the world wants. That something that the world wants is called oil. Because the world wants it and I have it in abundance, I can sell it at a very high price. And I'm going to be getting a lot of money. As I get a lot of money, it's all foreign exchange. Okay? 
I'm not selling in pesos, I'm selling in dollars, the oil. I'm getting a lot of revenue in foreign exchange. As I get that revenue in foreign exchange, I take a decision. And my decision is, I am not going to be switching the model of development that you told me from an import substitution to an export-led, private sector-led development. What I'm going to do now is, because I'm rich, who is I? The government. Who is the government? José López Portillo. Who is José López Portillo? The president of Mexico. What mentality does he have? I want to be the savior of this country. And because I have that mentality and I have the cash, I immediately start the process through which I'm going to tell all of you, don't worry, we're all going to be happy. Because what I'm going to be doing is, I'm going to be getting this money. Remember the import substitution policy that we followed before? Just watch what we're going to do now. You are the private sector, you are used to subsidies, you are used to support, you are used to protection. I'm going to give you even more protection now because I have the money and I'm going to be making you now the ones developing this country, going into more industrialization. And so the development plan of López Portillo is spectacular all of a sudden. And his phrase is, now we have to learn how to manage abundance. Okay. And so, this is the worst thing that could have happened to us. Because at a time when they were being forced to change their mentality into an export-oriented mentality, this incredible abundance of oil and the high price of oil made people like Lopez Portillo to become convinced that this was the time through which the state will invest heavily and transform Mexico. And so, the big question was, if you are going to do that, do you have the cash? And the answer was, yes, because I don't have the cash yet from oil, but I know that I will have it. And so I'm going to the financial institutions of the world, and I'm going to be asking for loans. And so companies like Citibank, which is the villain of all the stories, okay, and many other banks like that, we look at a client called Mexico, who has a tremendous resource called oil, which is used by the whole world in terms of the production process that we have in our economies. And the price of the oil that he's selling is very high. And I know that the stream of revenues of this country is going to be very high in the future. Okay? I make all my estimates and I lend them lots and lots and lots of money. What you saw last time was how the external debt of Mexico just jumped. Because what happened all of a sudden is you are a rich person. And because you are a rich person, I am going to be lending you. This bank is behaving irresponsibly, okay? Because it's taking an estimate that the price of oil is going to be high all over the 20 years of the loan or 30 years of the loan. And therefore that you are going to be able to pay me, pay me back. But you are a good client right now. I lend you the money, and then you are not specializing in one product. What you are doing is you are convinced that you were lucky, lucky, and will always be lucky. Okay? And what you do is you go and you ask for loans. Your external debt skyrockets went from 20 billion, well actually after the end of the stabilization period was about 7 billion and it went from 7 billion to 85 billion in 12 years. Okay? That's two sexenios. 
And when you are here, guess what? The price of oil goes down. So you made an estimate that you're going to be a rich person. You know, most of you do that all the time, yeah? You think about, well, let me see. I'm going to start working. When I start working, I'm going to be making 10,000 pesos. But I am sure that because I am a graduate of Food Lab, I will be making 30,000 by the year two, and probably 70,000 by the year five. Because I'm going to be making this amount of money, I'm going to start spending it right now. So I'm not going to be spending 10. I'm going to start spending 15. And then next year, I will start spending 20. Because even then, I know that I'm going to have cash in excess. Except what happens if all of a sudden you only get 10,000 in this year? You owe a large amount of money, you have to pay. The nice thing to you is that no one is going to make you the loans, OK? Because they will look at these things and they will say, let me see your record, and let me see 10 years. And after 10 years, I will make you the loan. They didn't do that to Mexico. The moment that they saw that we had that amount of oil and that the price of oil was so high, everybody went into the same trap. Everybody, OK? I mean, the Mexican government and the guys who lend money to the Mexican government. And so the responsibility was on both sides. These guys lend like crazy to Mexico, and Mexico borrowed like crazy. The combination was a terrible combination. One, because we didn't change our mentality. We remain a protectionist economy, because now we have the money to afford that. We gave subsidies, and when enterprises were going bankrupt, we bought the enterprises, and so what you will see in this period it's an incredible period of statization. The state increases its size in terms of the volume. Same thing I was telling you, all you need to do is exactly the same numbers as exports, imports over GDP. It's what is the size of the public sector in terms of the economy. And you will see that we're reaching levels of 50%, 60%. Okay? Now, don't get too surprised. You go to France, and France today, the size of the public sector as a total of the economy is about 48%. Okay? So what we're talking about is, if you have a mentality of a state-induced growth protectionism, then you become that kind of a state. And you will say, well, France is an open economy. Yes. And at the same time, it's a state-led economy, definition of this. That's why President Hollande came out in his campaign and said, and what I will do, 75% tax on everybody who owns or wins more than 1 million euros per year. And he did. And that's why Gerard Repardieu now is a Russian citizen, yeah? Because what he said immediately is, thank you very much, I'm going to go to Russia. So this is funny, you know? You have a French actor who must be worth about 300 million euros, taking a decision that I'm not going to be living in France anymore, I'm going to live in Belgium, and I'm going to be a Russian citizen. Weird things happen in this globalized world, okay? But the worst is, look at what's happening with the mentality of the Mexicans. We are protectionists. We are protectionists. When the circumstances are forcing us to become non-protectionists, we hit the lottery and we become protectionists. Even worse, whereas here I have a state-led development process where the state was trying not to get too involved in the economy, developing a private sector, industrial sector, etc. Here we have a fully state-led development. As a result of that, by the year 1982, three years after the price of oil goes down, the Mexican economy is going to find, is going to find itself with a heavy debt in dollar terms, with very few capacities to do a substitution, and as a result of that, we were forced to move into 
the export-led development that we are facing today. Okay? I'm gonna show off that's you know what show off is? <laughs> Presumir? Huh? So I'm gonna show off uh, because I think it's important that you understand one thing. Um, we get nineteen eighty two, okay? And we are really bankrupt. The problem with the economy in nineteen eighty two is we don't have the resources to continue moving anyway. In fact, we went into default. We didn't service our debt because we didn't have the capacity. Now, because Mexicans are a very special brand of people, yeah, we defaulted because we, we couldn't afford to pay. But when the government of Miguel de la Madrid got into power, what they did is they renegotiated the debt. That's the time of not the Brady Bunch, but the Brady Bunch. Yeah? You know what the Brady Bunch is? No. No? Yes. What is it? Okay, so it was not the Brady Bunch, it was the Brady Bonds, okay? The Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, last name Brady, helps the Mexican government to renegotiate the debt, and bonds are issued which are called the Brady bond Bonds, and those bonds are going to allow the Mexican government to do a couple of things. One of them is a reduction on the debt, which is going to be negotiated with the banks, and in fact, the honoring of the debt. So you had a combination of both. And there were people at the time telling the Mexican government, forget about it. If you are dealing with a bank called Citibank, it is a private sector bank. They made a lot of profits out of the loans that they made to you, and they should have known the risk that they got involved into. And because they got involved into those risks, they were supposed to go bankrupt. So let them go bankrupt, don't pay them. Argentina, recently. Yeah? Under the Kirchner's, what Argentina does is exactly that. So what you're looking at is, the world continues to be the same way. There are still people today saying, don't repay the capitalists, because they are the ones who are exploiting you. They exploited you, they got money, they got everything. Don't pay them. The Mexican government at the time said, no way, I'm going to be doing the honorable thing. I'm not saying that they say that, but... And the honorable thing is I'm going to repay my debts. But I cannot repay the size of debts I have. So they, they sat with the American government and the IMF and the World Bank, and they negotiated a process through which they were able to put together a combination that in fact reduce a certain percentage of the total stock of debt they had at the time. That was really what they were given as breathing space. But they really honored the rest of the debt. And so what you will see, I mean this is not the course for that, but what you will see in this period is all the process of the opening of the economy because we need to generate other sources of foreign resources at the same time that we accept the debt that we have, we reduce a portion of that debt through the negotiation process with the IMF, the World Bank, and the US Treasury, and in the end, I honor the rest of the debt. My problem is, in between, I need loans because I don't generate enough foreign exchange. And that's the reason why I sat and I renegotiate all this. Because unless I renegotiate debt, unless I get new debt so that I can make the payments and still import the things that I need, I won't be able to grow. But I know that that will not be the solution. The solution is I have to start generating more and more and more resources from a source other than oil because this is what's happening with oil. 
oil is going down in terms of price. And I'll come back to what Cardinal said in that bit, okay? So the problem here is I need to make a substitution of this 15 billion, if you want to put it that way, and therefore I need to go from 15 to 7 to the opposite. But look what's happening in these years. As the price of oil goes down, I lose income from oil. I keep exporting, but I'm losing income because the price is going down. And so my efforts are being very complicated because at the same time that I'm trying to diversify my economy, I am losing my major source of income in foreign exchange. So no matter how much efforts I put into this process, my past <laughs> keeps following me. Okay? What is the meaning of my past following? First, because I am so dependent on oil, as the price of oil keeps going down, I lose income. And I lose income at an accelerated pace. As I am opening my economy and I'm making software everybody because of that, I am increasing my revenues, but I'm not increasing my revenues at the same speed as I'm losing revenues. This is a major difference between the growth of China and ours, okay? We were heavily dependent on oil. You have to imagine what this means. This means suffering, okay? This means hell. Because what it implies is, I am making you work harder and harder and harder, and you still don't get the same revenues that you were getting before. So the question for the population right here is, I mean, give me a break, what is this nonsense? Here we are working like crazy to pay someone which is called Citibank. Well, I'm gonna pay these guys. Politically speaking, it's very complicated, okay? How do you tell people that you have to honor your debts when you keep starving your family? How do you tell people that? Well, that's what the Greeks are facing right now. That's what the Spaniards are facing right now. It's exactly the same. Not because of the same reasons, but exactly the same situation. You are telling the Spaniards right now, you are not going to grow, and you still have to pay your debts. You say, wait a minute. I mean, you know, I, I already cut my pound of flesh, and I have no more flesh left. You know, the two kilos that I gained during vacations are already lost. And I already lost another six kilos. And you're asking me to still keep losing weight? No, there is a point where if I keep losing weight, I'm going to die. This is Mexico. In addition, we are telling the Mexicans, and the best solution is opening the economy, which implies everything that was created before, which was for internal market, is now going to disappear. And the moment I open my economy, guess whom I'm going to be facing? My competitor, which is a lot faster than I am because it's already there, while I'm still trying to catch up in terms of productivity. Because I specialize myself in this. So I have to specialize. And trade is going to force me to specialize. If you move the clock forward, from the year 1986 to the year 2013, you will see the result. The result is today, in the middle of the crisis of the rest of the countries, we are doing okay. Yeah? Yeah, but this is 1986. When were you born? Don't tell me, but somewhere around there, okay? So the problem that you are going to be facing is, the people who are living in 1986 has no idea what's going to be the situation in the year 2013. Because maybe if I could do that, if I could take the picture of 2013 and then go back in time, sit down with them and say, look at these beautiful children that are going to be happy in the year 2013. And so you have to suffer. Maybe that generation will say, fine, I'll suffer. Uh, this is 1986, you are living in 1986, this is your life. And so when someone comes to you and says, by the year 2013, you're going to be great. Let me see. I am 40, 
I am going to be 65. You know what? The hell with it. Let the next generation suffer. Mm -hmm. So what you are facing is a very difficult situation. Okay? But in addition, what I'm trying to tell you is it's even worse because the mentality of export-led development does not exist. It never existed in this country. The majority of the people were raised in a mentality of import substitution growth. Fast growth, middle class, no inflation. Then all of a sudden, we had a crisis. And we went into a state-led development rather than an open economy. And when we got the oil, it was worse. Because then, because we had the oil, we used the proceedings of the oil to maintain the protectionist frame of mind of our economy. This is, whether you believe it or not, what's still happening today. Because people are comparison, making comparisons between Brazil and Mexico. Okay? The Brazilians have kept an import substitution, market protection, growth process. We, because of this, jumped into the bandwagon of open economy, export-led growth. Okay? Everything was okay until the year, and I go back to your question, 2000. Because when we came to government, and I, I'm talking in first person because I was there, okay? One of the questions that we asked ourselves was, okay, the government of Salinas de Gortari went into NAFTA trade agreements, opening of the economy through that process, okay? The government of Miguel de la Madrid wasn't convinced, Miguel de la Madrid was never convinced, fully convinced that you have to go into an open left economy, okay? But he had no other option. So because they didn't have an option, they went into GATT and all these things. Salinas de Gortari was convinced that you had to go for the opening of the economy. But he also became convinced that it was not true WTO type of things, because that didn't move. And he wanted to move faster. So what he did is he went and he negotiated NAFTA. Now remember, NAFTA is not the first free trade agreement of Mexico, okay? This is what people forget. This is not the first free trade agreement. The first free trade agreement of Mexico is with Chile. And so we have an antecedent, the, the previous, which was the treaty with Chile. Depends what kind of history you want to... There is stories that, in fact, what happened is that President Salinas went to Europe because he wanted to make an agreement with the Europeans. And as he went with the Europeans, the Europeans poo-pooed him. As they poo-pooed him, he came back and said, fine, then I'm American. And he went with NAFTA. My guess is that he knew from the beginning that the relationship with NAFTA was the most important one. And he simply went for that. As he went for that, he really was making the right move. Because what he was thinking is, which is the most important market that we have? The United States market. Which is the most important combination of things that we can have? Is maquiladora industry. And therefore, we're going to be doing what the Chinese did. We're going to be installing companies that will be producing for the American market. And that way, we're going to be growing. We're going to bring technology. We're going to bring foreign direct investment. We're going to be bringing development for Mexico. My mentality is an export-led growth, foreign direct investment but to invest into export-led things. He goes for that, he makes NAFTA. Some of his people are a little bit on the extreme, okay? And so what they say is free market is what should be working. And therefore, in order to erase all kind of industrial policies of the past, and I'm going to your answer, your question, 
I am going to be eliminating any kind of industrial policy. And it is said that Jaime Serra, who at the time was the Minister of Trade, it was not called economy, it was called Trade and uh, Industrial Promotion, okay, Secofi, said, I'm not sure that he did, okay, but this is what everybody said. Everybody said that he said the best industrial policy is no policy. Okay? Meaning, let the market decide. Don't interfere with the market. Now, knowing as I know Jaime, he probably didn't say that, but he believed it, okay? So, they began doing a policy of no policy. No support, no credit, no subsidies, no things like that. Even though they were moving slowly, very smart, very good. Pedro Aspe, who at the time was the Secretary of Hacienda, was very good in what he was doing. Jaime Sierra, Serra was very good. Under Jaime Serra was Herminio Blanco, who now is looking for the job of WTO. Herminio was the undersecretary. And Herminio was the one in charge. Jaime was okay, but Herminio was the one who was really negotiating NAFTA. So Herminio Blanco negotiated NAFTA, as a result of which, when Cedillo became president, Herminio was the Minister of Trade. Okay? Just to give you an idea how people I don't, don't, don't take this. Uh, the nickname of Herminio Blanco among the business community was Exterminio Blanco, okay? Why? Because if Serra believed in that, he really was convinced of it. And so during his exenio, there was no industrial policy in Mexico. So when we got to government, we simply sat and thought and said, look, I mean, this is impossible. This is not something you can do, okay? I mean, even though I believe in that, you cannot do it, politically speaking. So <laughs> we will cancel some of these ideas. And during my two years in this secretaria, first thing I did is I changed the name. So it's no longer a coffee, it's called Economia. Why do we change the name to Economia? Why did I suggest it and the president accept it? Because economy means, I'm not specializing in one sector, I'm really looking at the overall real sector of the economy. And you need a secretaria that will be looking at the real sector of the economy. Because there is one that looks at the financial sector, and that's called Hacienda. But you need a counterpart to that, and you need a secretaria that will be looking at the real sector of the economy. And if you look at the real sector of the economy, you're going to be looking at how do I help the agricultural sector in terms of policy? How do I help this, this, this energy and data? And so we created the economy secretariat, and in that we invented something called the subsecretaria of PYMES. Okay? So this is terrible for someone like myself, okay? But what it implies is I'm back to the 50s and 60s and I'm going to be retaking some of the industrial policies that created the middle class. And I'm going to be promoting policies for small enterprises. Because that's the only way that you're going to be able to solve one big problem in Mexico, which was the need to support those enterprises where the majority of jobs are created, which is the small and medium enterprises. Those are not the most efficient, okay? <laughs> but those are the ones where you do have the largest number of jobs. So we were not really, even though I may sound like that at times, we were not really free enterprise, free market, etc. We just thought, look, you have to keep all the good things of the free market, open economy, export left, but at the same time you have to help some of the small enterprises not to disappear because you need to continue to have jobs there. And then we did a second thing. We did this, and the other one that we did is we created 10 special programs. 
in which five were political and five were economic. This is the first time that anybody knows that, okay? Because we told that it was 10, everything like this. Lies. Five, we sat and we said, look, there are five sectors that we have to help whether we like it or not. Because politically speaking, we cannot just jump into the other. And so we went for five sectors and, uh, oh, you know, it was uh, commerce, so commercio en pequeño, you know, all these things. Sure, whatever they want. Huh? Uh, agriculture, fine. You know. Who cares? You know? What do we do for them? I don't know. I mean, give them whatever. And so we went for five of these things. But then we said, but there are five sectors that are very important for the economy in the future. Okay? One of them is TICS. We need a Silicon Valley in Mexico. And so we went and we talked to the big enterprises there and we told them, look, this is very important for Mexico. The development of Mexico will depend on whether we can move into the software industry and all these kind of things. And that's the reason why you have this growth in Guadalajara of the whole software industry. We created the program in support of software development, that kind of things. So that is working very nicely. Then we went to the car industry. And we told them, look, it doesn't make sense what we have right now, okay? It's nice and it's opening, but we need to go seriously into a higher platform. And we will help you in that platform. But it has to be a competitive platform to sell cars all over the world. As a result of that, I negotiated with Brazil and Argentina to sector agreements, okay? Which they all believed how smart we are because we are going to be creating a protective environment in which Brazil and Argentina thought they would win and they won in the short term. In the long run, we are dominating their markets because we are very competitive and they are not. And that's why they switched back to controls and all kind of things last year, because they were all of a sudden finding out that in the long run they are losing. And so we went for sectors that we thought were important, maquiladora. You know, the maquiladoras at the time were moving to China. What we knew is that they would have to come back at some point because there was going to be convergence in the prices. So we supported the maquiladoras and now they are growing very fast. And when you look at the sector, the other one is aerospace. Because we're convinced that you have to move into those areas, and so we're going to support you. That's the reason why Querétaro became the place where everybody is now making investments in planes and all these kind of things. So we went for these sectors, and that was the answer. We did industrial policy. But we didn't do industrial policy to protect. We went into industrial policy for future growth export-led industries. Because I am still convinced of that. Then I was taken off this and sent to Foreign Affairs, which I still don't know why, but anyway. And in this process, what we were building is what I call a knowledge economy. Because this is the future. Okay? The rest, I mean, agriculture is nice and all that. Thing. There, why do you have to work agriculture? Because to this age, 20% of the population live there. And that's the biggest poverty levels. The highest poverty levels are here. So, I mean, come on. You know, whether you like it or not, you cannot just say, well, you have to help them. You have to create policies. And so we create a lot of policies which give subsidies and support to agricultural production, which is a waste. But it's not a waste if you look at people. Anyway, all I'm saying to you is we didn't change mentality until Salinas got in power. Okay? When Salinas gets, you know, gets into power, he goes for NAFTA. As he goes for NAFTA, he really goes into the decisive way of creating the institutional change that will transform this country. So, why do I like Salinas a lot, okay? Even though I am from the PAN, he's from the PRI. Why? Because I think he's the president who really understood the need to make the switch and create the institutional structure that will force Mexico in a very serious way into that switch, 
Okay? Before him, we were all forced doing these things, but not really taking a decision. The creation of NAFTA is not only a trade agreement for Mexico, it's also the first institutional framework that will create an export-led development. Okay? This is the importance of NAFTA for Mexico. What NAFTA does, it transforms the industrial sector of Mexico. And that's when we really began to specialize in what we are good. Okay? Now, it's not going to be one product now. It's going to be a series of products. And you have to help some of them to reach that point. But you cannot subsidize them because then, I mean, you can subsidize, you can define certain things for a certain time. But you cannot subsidize that growth because what's going to happen is first you don't have the money anyway, but the second thing is then they will not be competitive. These industries are now so competitive that Mexico is exporting today over one billion dollars a day. One billion dollars a day. That's a lot of money. Yeah, 80% goes to the United States, fine. Still is one billion dollars a day. There are very few countries who have that rate of exports. The point is we're also importing one billion dollars a day. Okay? And therefore, that billion dollars can be paid for by the one billion dollar export. And they also create jobs. Because whether you believe it or not, people work in those areas. They have to distribute, they have to do a lot of things. So all of this is market-oriented and is working in Mexico. However, the problem that we all are facing right now is, despite all these things, there is a large sector of the Mexican society which is still is not convinced that export-led free trade policies are the best for development. Because they use arguments which are also correct, which are arguments of distribution of wealth. And what they're going to be telling you constantly is, look at Brazil and look at Mexico. Brazil is an economy that has gone protectionist, protecting their people, making and forcing a better distribution of income. And they are a nicer country and they have grown more on average than we did. And that, in the past 10 years, is absolutely true. This is the first year, last year and this year, when we are showing that because we moved into this open type of program, we are better off than Brazil is. Okay? But try to convince people, as I said before, who were born you know, in 1919 and that have seen only these things, that we are better off than we were in 1986. Unless you read history, you won't believe me, okay? So the point is, one of the reasons why I bring this in, in this class is, it's very important that you understand that if you go for an export lead, if you go for this type of opening, if you really believe in WTO and in all these trade treaties and everything else, you're going to be facing a tremendous opposition from interest groups which are right there because they want subsidies and from the fact that you have not been able to reach a point where income distribution is the right distribution in Mexico. Is that the fault of free trade policies? The answer is no. That is the fault of monopoly protectionist policies that we still have in this country. One very important is the policy of telecommunications. Since we are moving into the knowledge economy, one of the key elements for that to work is telecoms. If I have one dominant player in the market who controls the way that you're going to be selling web uh, bandwidth, etc., in terms of all these things, then you're going to drop. Okay? Because everything moves now by internet. Everything is put in there, everything is... And if you don't have that capacity to become more and more technical oriented because someone is selling you internet 
at a high price, then you are in trouble. Now, what is the answer to that? Well, we have a series of deputados who are coming now and saying, the solution to that, guess what is? Internet is going to be obligatory. What? Don't do those things, man. It's not going to work because then what you're asking is the government to create a whole network and support it and subsidize it, and it's going to be very expensive. So don't do that. Go for the market. Go for the free enterprise. Let the people do it, but go for competition. Don't allow one company to be dominant. Don't allow two companies to be dominant. Open the market so everybody can participate. One of the problems of that policy is the following. If I am the dominant player, what is my name? You know the name of the dominant player? Yes. No, Telmex. Yes. Uh, also Televisa, yes. But that's it. <laughs> and so the problem is, for me to reach your house and sell you the product, I need what is called the last mile, you know? which implies you do have a network for distributing the internet, and I don't have that network. If I'm going to build that network, <laughs> it's going to be extremely expensive, because I have to make tremendous investments. So what I need is authorization to use your network and provide through your network competition. But you are the owner of the network, and so you say, wait a minute, this is not a fair game, because I already made all these investments. The reason why Nextel and all these companies cannot compete in many ways is because they have to build the network. And the cost of building those networks is huge, immense. So you have to help those to really reach the point where they can reach your house. But the only one who reaches your house right now is Telmex, okay? or Telcel if you wish, because they have a dominant switch. So even though we can do many things, this is the problem of how we developed ourselves. Well, we are no longer in 1986, we are in the year 2013. Our economy is about 65% to 70% linked to foreign trade between exports and imports. We are a very open economy. We are a very dependent company, but if you think about Singapore, you're going to find that Singapore has about 140% related to GDP. I mean, GDP related to foreign trade. So how is that possible? Because they are now in a different world, okay? And so they are beyond their own capacity. They manage more things than you would expect. That's an open economy, okay? It's also a very small country. This is important for you because now, I hope, you understand why it's so difficult to sell free trade in Mexico, okay? And it remains hard. And so you have to come with, okay, five and five. So then what I do, I'm catering to the interest groups at the same time that I'm creating the basis for the other one. I cannot go just for this. But that's what they tried to do in Salinas and Cedillo's time. And it didn't work. I mean, it worked and it didn't work because you have all this tremendous reaction. Okay. So you have to make the combination, and what we are hoping is that as you move in this direction, these sectors are going to be growing as they are very fast. They're going to employ more people. They're going to bring in more investment. As you keep growing on that one, then you can start eliminating these ones. Okay? And that's what you do. That's what you hope. And this is the combination that you do because you, this is a democracy, and therefore I cannot impose what I want. Nor I should try to do so. Okay? We're moving in that direction. And so next class, we will just close this chapter. Looking very quickly at some of the things. We are a country who has trade agreements with 42 nations, but we don't have 42 treaties. Okay? That's a lie. Most people will come to you and say, Mexico is the most open free trade because it has free trade agreements with 42 countries. It does, it does have free trade agreements with 42 countries, but not 42 trade agreements. Okay? We only have 14 trade agreements, and those are related to European Union, which brings a lot of countries in one single shot. And now we have the Central America Treaty with five countries, and we have NAFTA with two countries. And so, in fact, we have less trade agreements than countries that we are in agreement with. 
Any questions?